Mol bona nit a tothom. Buenas noches. Uh, good evening, everybody. And welcome uh, to our very special event today, together with John Moab and Zadeh. Uh, thank you very much, John, for participating to this session. Uh, today, we'll talk about the future of mobility. And uh, I think uh, uh, I will explain you in a while why this is a so special day for us. I'm Gabriele Palma, the Managing Director of Casa Seat. And it's really a pleasure to have this conversation with John, who is, in fact, a very special guest for us. Because uh, you may know that uh, with John, we had actually the very first event of Casa Seat, which was digital. It was planned to be uh, with the presence of John in Barcelona, but due to the uh, emergency of the uh, COVID measures, it was impossible at that time to fly. So John promised to be here as soon as possible. And in fact, he kept the promise. And as soon as the airport were open again, he flew uh, directly to Barcelona to stay with us. That makes uh, this day very special for us and for me, because it was really my first uh, conversation uh, with Casa Seat. So um, I think um, we will need to, uh, I think it's fair to uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, about John, because uh, uh, John is actually one of the most important um, uh, thoughts of, of the mobility. He's a, a, a fellow of the MIT in Boston, the mobility initiative of the MIT. He's senior advisor to the Deloitte Future of Mobility practice, and is also an advisor of the uh, um, Assembly Ventures. And before joining the MIT, John was a head of mobility and member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum for over 15 years in Geneva and in New York, leading a team which was focused on many elements, but uh, especially on urban mobility and integrated mobility, some of the elements that now are particularly important uh, regarding the development of the future of our business. And before giving to you the floor, John, let me explain a bit to the audience how we are going to handle uh, this session. As a first, John, we'll have a short presentation uh, based on some uh, charts uh, and focus on the vision that John has regarding the future of mobility. Uh, then we will have a conversation uh, with some of the experts of mobility, uh, which are also based in Barcelona. And finally, we will open uh, to the public uh, the option to have some questions uh, to John. Now uh, I will leave the word to John Moavenzarev. Please, a big applause to John. Okay, great. Well, Gabrielle, thank you so much for that kind introduction. It really is such a joy to be here. Such a beautiful city. I haven't been to Barcelona in over 15 years now, so it's, it's wonderful to be back, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so the title of my presentation is A Complete Misnomer. Post-COVID world. We're really not in the post-COVID world, right? We're, we're living through the age of the Delta variant, and there's still so much insecurity about where this pandemic is going. But I would say we are in the, the post-COVID world, and we've passed the, at least the first stage, at least the first year of COVID. And that has had an impact on all of us. So what's changed with COVID? How we work has changed. This is not true if you cut hair or you work in a factory. This is true if you work in an office. And I, I think we, have, we will see this uh, profound uh, transformation. We've all become very comfortable with digital technologies, with Zoom and all of these platforms. And so to, to imagine that we're going back to uh, working at the office full time five days a week I, I don't see that moving forward necessarily, at least uh, where I am based in, in the United States. Uh, the nature of healthcare has changed. Of course, we have to have face-to-face -face interaction with our doctors, certainly for medical procedures. But there are times when we don't, and that was something that at least where I am in the United States was quite rare, you know, to have a, a basic 
even just a telephone call with your doctor, and now that is much more widely accepted. Education, the nature of big lectures is changing. Uh, where we actually live, and this is a very important one with implications for transportation that we'll talk a bit more about. Now, what has not changed with COVID? Well, the challenge of climate change and the many, many environmental challenges facing the planet has not changed. Um, the expense of transportation, it's a very large proportion of our disposable income in the United States, transportation accounts for about 17% of our after-tax income. Uh, that is the second largest spend after housing. Uh, so anything that drives this cost down is likely to succeed going forward. And the relentless advance of technology uh, has not changed either. So the way that I like to sort of think about this, which is what we talked about a year ago, is that the pandemic has created these kind of um, elastic changes where things will bounce back to the way that they were, and it has created some structural changes. And the longer this lasts, the more that balance shifts to more structural changes. And that's driven by us. It's driven by our behavior. It's driven by our values. So the way that I like to think about the impact of COVID on mobility is not so much to think about mobility itself, but to think about why we consume mobility. We consume it for healthcare. We consume it to, to do productive work, to get educated, to meet our friends, our family. These are the reasons and these are the places that we are drawn to, to move from our homes uh, to these places and to get around in cities and, and our communities. And so this is, I think, the, really the question to ask, what's the impact of COVID on these various uh, different activities? So that's a little bit of setting the stage, reflecting on what we talked about a year ago. Now, for today, I'd like to just consider three basic ideas. Uh, let's start with the first one, which is around the very, very important connection between mobility and land use. So there are three questions that we can consider. The first is, and I alluded to this a year ago, can we imagine that COVID will cause a sort of reversal in this massive global trend of urbanization that we have undergone? You know, 300 million people moving from the countryside in China to the cities over a 15 year period. And those types of mass human migrations that have happened just in the past few decades. Could COVID possibly put a reverse to that? And I think we have to ask, well, the, where are, which countries are in fact more urbanized? It's very clear, this is UN data, that wealthier countries are more urban. So what we may see is a very different answer to the question about reverse urbanization in the wealthy countries versus the less wealthy countries. Um, my personal opinion on this is that COVID will not cause a massive reversal in urbanization. You know, we lived through a pandemic 100 years ago. It didn't cause a reversal in urbanization back then. I think over the long term, it's hard to imagine it now. But, and my slide is stuck here. There we go. Okay, wait. Okay. Um, that sort of brings us to this second question, which is, okay, if we can imagine a significant movement of people from city centers to uh, the countryside, I guess imagining that an apartment in Barcelona in the center of the city is quite expensive, and you know, perhaps that you could, you could live in a, a beautiful village in the Costa Brava in a wonderful house um, and perhaps some folks are choosing to make that trade-off. We see those types of dynamics happening uh, in, in my country, uh, in the US. And then that raises this question of, okay, if that does happen, will it actually lead to more vehicle kilometers traveled or less? Uh, 
Um, and I think that clearly because of the substitution of working from home, from the commuting perspective, it will be less, but it could be more for getting the basic necessities, uh, you know, basic uh, shopping and, and those other activities that I alluded to. So the picture is entirely unclear, right? What would be the, the impact on uh, miles traveled? And then a third question is, you know, will we see an acceleration toward what in the United States is called the shared streets movement? I think it very much builds on Europe, which was very far ahead in the thinking about the design of city streets. And this really comes down to the question, for whom do we design our streets? Do we design them first for people and then for cars and bicycles and other modes of transport? Or do we design them first for cars and then, and then for, for people? And I think here the answer is clearly yes, we will see uh, an acceleration. Uh, we've been rethinking uh, what our streets should look like now uh, for many years with the rise of uh, shared vehicles, of micromobility, um, and this concept that, you know, streets really should be more for cars. So this is a photo from New York City. Uh, you know, this is not exactly what this part of New York City looked like two years ago with this expansion of sort of the restaurants occupying the streets. This outdoor dining program that was supposed to be temporary has now become permanent. So you can think of that as kind of a, a potential structural change caused by COVID. Um, very interesting work about rethinking what vehicles should look like. Um, I think SEAT is doing some very interesting work in that area. If any of you who just passed through the lobby, you've seen vehicles that did not look like what SEAT was offering 10 years ago. And that's an exciting development. Um, this is a funny set of pictures from different places around the world. It's a sort of, you know, um, activist movement to point out that the space taken up on a city street really does have value. And so these people just kind of set up desks and decided to camp out there to make the point that this real estate, these square meters can be used for something other than storage of a car, parking of a car. Lots of ideas about how to reimagine streets to be more flexible. So I would propose that in many ways COVID has accelerated this thinking of what could our streets actually look like? The second idea that I'd like to consider is the impact of electrification. We had, of course, um, very big news from the European Union yesterday about the goal of fully electric by the year 2035. Um, you know, the electric vehicle is not new. Right? It competed with the petrol vehicle 100 years ago when the automobile was invented, and in many ways it lost out due to the superior energy density of liquid fuels. But what has changed, right? What has changed? And I would like to submit that maybe let me just tell a little, um, just a little story here. My first job out of engineering school was working for a car company. I worked for Ford as a design engineer, my first job. And they put me on this rotational program, and they sent me to a transmission plant in Livonia, Michigan, that made automatic transmissions. Now, I don't know if any of you have tinkered with the inside of an automatic transmission, but I can tell you it is a very sophisticated piece of machinery with planetary gear sets, with a complex hydraulic circuit, a lot of complex machining goes into making this product. That product was made by Ford Motor Company. Engines, transmissions, powertrain components have been considered for forever as kind of the core business of automotive companies. Now we're seeing batteries and the electric vehicle powertrain technology, the power dynamics, the power management becoming core business of automotive companies. And this is a very, very recent 
and significant development. So I think what happened on March 15th of this year uh, with Volkswagen announcing this very significant commitment to bring battery design and production in-house um, and to build the, uh, the gigafactories, the battery production capacity um, here in Europe over a very short time frame, um, I think it's a very significant uh, development. And of course, um, Seat being part of the Volkswagen family is very much strategically aligned with that initiative. Uh, so this is part of what's really causing this, finally, this tipping point in electrification. Massive investment. So we have to follow the money. And the money that's flowing into electrification is coming from venture capital, it's coming from private equity, it's coming from huge investments from the automotive OEMs, as I've outlined here. Really unprecedented multi-billion dollar investments each year from these, from these uh, vehicle manufacturers. Now, it, you know, I don't hear this question so much in Europe, but I, remarkably, I still hear this question in the United States. Is an electric vehicle really cleaner than an internal combustion engine vehicle? Because, you know, what if the electricity is made with coal? Because you have to consider the mining of the materials that go into the battery. And that is exactly the right question to ask. You have to look at the full life cycle emissions. So MIT did a study on this two years ago. A number of different research organizations have looked carefully at this question of life cycle emissions. Um, the MIT study looked at these five vehicles that were currently on the market in the United States at the time, ranging from the vehicle on the left, which is a traditional petrol-powered internal combustion engine vehicle, um, to the, a full electric vehicle uh, second from the right, and a fuel cell vehicle all the way on the right. And this is what we found. Life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if you say that the internal combustion, the petrol vehicle, is at one, then the life cycle emissions coming from a full electric vehicle are 55% of that. And that's using the average power mix uh, in, the, in the US. Now, what's interesting is you, if you look carefully here, you'll see that there's the bar in green at the bottom, which is the greenhouse gas emissions associated from tr producing, from manufacturing the vehicle. And then there's the, the, the blue and purple above that, which is the greenhouse gas emissions from the production and consumption of the fuel. And it is clear that an electric vehicle, the production of an electric vehicle does generate more greenhouse gases, everything else equal, than the production of a traditional internal combustion vehicle. But that excess is far more than compensated with the reduction from the, the usage um, and the production of the fuel. Now, you have to look at the electricity mix. So this is a map of what is the primary source of fuel for the electricity grid in the 48 continuous states of the, of the US. If you look at a map of Europe, you see a very similar situation where in some countries, uh, coal might dominate. In some countries, natural gas might dominate. In, in other countries, it might be hydro and renewables. So in the US, the dirtiest state in the country in terms of the electricity grid happens to be West Virginia, where 93% of the electricity is produced from burning coal. The cleanest state in the country happens to be Washington State, where 71% you know, of it is hydro energy. So this gives you a sense of how important the grid mix is for electric vehicles. But even with the dirtiest state in the US, you still have lower greenhouse gas emissions, point number one. Point number two, this is a moving target. Every single year, we're adding more renewables to the production of electricity. And so every year, those electric vehicles, the usage of those electric vehicles, will, the greenhouse gases will be reduced. Um, three questions to consider. Uh, number one, 
the supply of minerals. So where is the lithium going to come from? Where is the cobalt uh, going to come from? Many companies are trying to move away from cobalt because it's overwhelmingly mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has a number of issues uh, related to child labor and so forth. Um, and security of supply, where some of the materials going into these batteries are locked up by certain countries. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, really the battery production in the world is in many ways dominated by Japan, China, South Korea. So there will be a massive sort of catch-up effort required in, in North America and in Europe uh, to build up this battery production uh, capacity. A second big challenge is just around the recycling. How do we, these are very large structures, the batteries that go into an electric vehicle. How do we prevent them from ending up in landfills uh, in the future? So really there's an effort to sort of build an industrial ecosystem to recapture um, the, ma the materials from those batteries and repurpose them. Um, and then finally, the impact on labor, there's been you know, because an electric vehicle inherently uses less parts than an internal combustion vehicle, there have been some arguments that it's going to have a big shift on labor. Um, BCG published a report saying, no, it should be about the same amount of labor. Regardless, what will happen is that there will be structural labor shifts in the automotive production industry, right? So certain components uh, will no longer be made that are associated with internal combustion engines with time. And so those jobs will have to be repositioned or repurposed. So it's an issue to watch. The third thing I'd like to talk about is mobility integration. So, um, you know, I was asked many years ago at the World Economic Forum uh, by a group of CEOs, they said, what, what do you think is the, the biggest challenge facing the global transportation system? Or what, what's the holy grail? What needs to be solved in transportation? And I think it's the biggest challenge, but also the biggest opportunity is this question of integration. So integration of on the physical level of vehicles and infrastructure, on the digital level of data and payments, and on very importantly, on the institutional level because transportation involves governments at many, many different layers, city, regional, national, and supranational. So what, what does this really look like? So there's just some pictures about what I mean by integration. This is a concept from, from Airbus, from the Geneva Motor Show several years ago that shows these sort of pods being lifted off of vehicle skateboards and lifted up into, into the sky. This is another concept uh, from a, sort of a delivery vehicle. Um, so, you know, if, if the DHL van drives into the small village of uh, Yore de Mar or somewhere and, you know, it's making deliveries in the center of the village, but there's always that one guy that lives in the house at the top of the hill. So the drone picks up the package off the vehicle and takes it to the guy who lives on the top of the hill, therefore reducing net CO2 emissions. This is another concept of integration. Um, I had a conversation with the CEO of uh, Volvo, the, you know, the truck uh, manufacturer, and he said, John, we're building an electric bus. This is several years ago in Gothenburg. And I said, that's fantastic. And he said, no, no, but you don't understand. You know, we actually drive this bus through the library at Chalmers University. And you know, it's that moment that something sort of went off in my head of thinking of, wow, you know, an electric vehicle driving through a building because it's clean, we don't have to worry, it's quiet. That enables a whole new concept in even what a bus is. My image of a bus is sitting at a bus stop in the rain, uh, not knowing when the thing will show up. This is a very different uh, vision of what a bus could actually be. That is because of integration. And of course, the big excitement, urban aerial mobility, being able to move people through the skies um, this is an image from Uber when they invested in this space. Uh, lots of opportunity there to build these kind of sky ports that will actually connect urban aerial mobility with surface mobility. Now, um, 
some of the work that I do with uh, with the venture fund, with Assembly Ventures, uh, they, my colleagues there wrote a very interesting piece called The Case Against Case. So what do we mean by case? So connected, autonomous, shared, electric. These have been the four magic words in mobility for several years now. <clears throat> well, first of all, connected, autonomous, electric, those are technologies shared is a business model. It's something different. It's, a, it's behavioral as well. So they don't really go together that well. Um, I have argued, as I just did, that integration is the way to move forward of connecting all of this. But uh, Assembly came up with a sort of a different way to think about this, which I think is useful which is to say, let's not forget about the built environment, the way that the CEO of Volvo was thinking about the bus driving through the library at Chalmers University. Let's think about how transport and mobility integrate with that built environment. Then let's think about systems which connect the sort of digital world and the physical world. And then let's think about applications which connect all of this to you and me, as we do when we look at our phone waiting for a DD or an Uber or what have you, Cabify. So my argument here is that, you know, this quest to build a kind of Amazon of personal mobility is a very difficult challenge because, I, in my view, transportation is not a sort of winner-take-all system, and that's because of some fundamental characteristics. It lies at the intersection of digital and physical assets. That's, you, that is a little bit different than some of the other apps that you use on your phone. Um, it's inherent, it's both global and very, very local at the same time. You know, the innovation, these technologies are moving around the world, but implementation of them is not evenly distributed around the world. Air travel is global, public transport is local. <laughs> There's the next one. Um, owning the customer interface, I think, works for in the purely digital environment, but once you bring in that physical dimension, uh, it introduces a number of challenges. And so just to conclude, I think that sort of the winners in this game are those companies that very actively seek to partner, to collaborate, to engage in a kind of uh, ecosystem. Um, and again, right, that's why we're here, right, to engage with the public to say, what do you think, what do you, what do you see as the challenges going forward? Um, a company here in Spain that we work with closely at MIT that I've been really impressed with is Ferrovial, uh, you know, a traditional sort of you know, mobility operator, but very much exploring other opportunities uh, with Hyperloop, with a consortium around sort of 5G connectivity, uh, with their agreement with a German uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, a company called Lilium, doing some really exciting things in the state of Florida, um, and so forth. So very much taking that kind of outward-looking um, ecosystem approach. Let's see. There we go. Um, so uh, let me just say a word about sort of uh, the platform issue. So, you know, when when I attended this kind of, this Uber Elevate Summit back in the pre-COVID world in June of 2019, you know, I had some takeaways. One of them was like, this is a company that has a vision to be the Amazon of personal mobility. Um, and the CEO said it. He said, we, we need to enter the third dimension. We need to go up to the sky. And they did some really, really impressive things. But now here we are, two years later, and last year was a very significant year in Uber's sort of vision. Now, of course, COVID had a devastating impact for the profitability of a company like Uber, and so they had to unwind some of these assets. But 
it, it was a, let's say, significant shift in the strategic vision of the company, but they still maintained very close relationships with Jump, which was their micro-mobility company that they basically sold off to a competitor, but now they use Uber's platform to connect uh, with their uh, autonomous driving unit um, and with the whole concept of urban aerial mobility that, that Uber was pursuing that they um, essentially sold to uh, Joby Aviation. So, you know, we used to think like, it, as we do with, in many technology circles, if you, you know, if you own the customer, you own the platform and vice versa, and there were these visions of integration. But you know, looking, reflecting on what we've seen in the transportation space, um, that has backpedaled a little bit. And again, I do think that this is because of the importance and the uniqueness of the integration with the built environment that we need to achieve these, these visions uh, in, in transportation. And with that, if I can advance to the next slide. So, <laughs> um, just three questions that I think we should all be thinking about. Um, so, the, you know, the first question is what, you know, we want to achieve. Here I would say there's three values we should focus on, safe, clean, and inclusive mobility. Uh, the second is how will we achieve these goals, and these are some of the levers that change our behavior, pricing, regulation, um, data management, and so forth. And then finally, who should be the players uh, involved? Um, and so I conclude with that, and I very much look forward to questions and the conversation that follows. Thank you very much, John. I think it was uh, really inspiring. Thanks a lot. Your, your vision is really clear and helps to tackle uh, all the, the elements of the challenges of, of mobility. But I think it's now interesting to, to listen also the voice, the voices of uh, a few experts that we have also in the room and to live in Barcelona. I will start with uh, Josep. Jose Maria Val is the president of the automotive class, industrial cluster of Catalonia and he keeps every day the pulse of the automotive industrial cluster in our region. So Josep, I would like to ask you uh, what you see as the main challenges uh, of, of the cluster that you actually represent in Catalonia due to this change of the mobility for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John, for your explanation. It is very clear and very interesting speech. Well, well, my point of view about that how the mobility will, will transform our, our life and our industries is I think that I focus the point in uh, OEMs. And uh, the challenges uh, for me will be uh, that the OEMs will change a lot in the future. In the future that in the, <laughs> in, I think that this year, maybe next year, not, not in the future in five years. I think that the OEMs will change a lot because they are changing the focus in before it was the own design, own, own manufacturing processes, uh, uh, the, the, their own cars. And now the focus is the people, is the people, is the person, is the potential buyer. And then for the reason, for the reason, all the organization in the OEMs will change a lot, uh, starting for the design processes and following with the, the, the purchasing departments and manufacturing processes. And then uh, later on, later on, all the industry of the components will follow, will follow the trends of the OEMs. Now the uh, industry of the components are waiting that uh, to, to, 
to, uh, to see that what happened, what happened with this m new mobility, what is new mobility for all of them. Yeah. And then the mirror, the mirror of the, uh, in, uh, the um, industry of the components, the mirror is the OEMs. And then for the reason, I think that in the next three years, in the next five years, all this supply chain will change completely, completely. And then uh, for me, uh, there is a lot of opportunities, opportunities for all of them. I think that opportunities that maybe now we are not uh, uh, looking for this because, because I think that it's not possible to, to see what happened. But it is clear that the opportunities will appear uh, immediately. This is, this is my point of view. Well, let me, let me just say, I, I completely agree with your point of view. For, just for those of you who made so the term OEM, original equipment manufacturer, means essentially the automobile manufacturers, the big companies that make cars. And uh, I do, I completely agree with you that they have radically changed uh, and will, and that the supply base will f sort of reflect and, and follow those changes. Um, in some ways, this has been undergoing for a long time. I mean, I remember over 20 years ago when Jack Nasser was the CEO of Ford, he was saying we need to move from a product company to a mobility services company. Uh, now, the problem was his vision was here, and the rest of the inertia of the company was, was still sort of living in the, in the traditional business model. I would suggest a very interesting question to a test of this is the next automotive executive you see, ask them two questions. First question, how many cars did you sell last year? Second question, what does it cost for a person to travel one kilometer in the city of Barcelona, or the city of Madrid, or in the countryside, or any city worldwide? And the way that they answer those questions will reflect exactly how, long, how far the car companies have, have come. Um, you know, 10 years ago, every automotive executive knew immediately how many cars they've sold because that's what we do. We make and sell cars, and we gauge our success by how many cars we've sold. But they didn't really care what it cost their customers in terms of insurance costs and you know, petrol costs and so, and so forth. To become a mobility services company, you have to understand what the customer feels and the true cost of the service for the customer. So I completely agree with you. Thank you very much. And uh, Josiah, would, uh, would you like to raise a question to John? Thank you. Uh, well, my question is that always I have I have the same question to me because <laughs> because I see that the expectations for the uh, manufacturing cars I think that only um, last year or two years ago two years ago practically in the world I think that the was. Uh, sold uh, approximately 100 uh, millions of cars, yeah. approximately, close. Yeah. But now the sales of cars, I think that is close to 70 millions. What happened with this gap? I think that the feature will be the same. I think that the feature will be an, a big decrease of production, a big decrease of sales, because of the new mobility, and then I think <laughs> it is not clear. It is not clear that the that the sales will move going ahead. I think that the sales will move <laughs> going down. Mm. I don't know. I, I don't know if uh, this is the <laughs> this is the point for you. Th that's that it, that theory is called peak auto. Right? It's modeled on the theory of peak oil, that we reach a point where the oil production peaks and then it slowly starts to decline. Um, and there's merit to the theory of peak auto uh, because of 
the, the forces that you pointed out with, with new mobility. Um, when you look at the fact that, that the, the world continues, the wealthy world in particular, you know, has been urbanizing, continues to urbanize, and you ask yourself, is the personal use automobile the best solution for urban mobility? I would submit, n no, it's not. It's not the best solution for urban mobility. Um, an automobile is very expensive. It's used less than 5% of the time. It's designed to go at extraordinary speeds that are rarely used. It has seats for three, four, five other people besides the driver that are rarely used. So the, the utilization of the asset doesn't necessarily make sense. Is that to say that the car is going away? No, absolutely. I mean, I, I firmly believe that cars are with us very much for the future. Having said that, though, this shift in business models where we may see less consumption of personal use automobiles and a shift toward more usage of automobiles in city centers, that, I, I, to me, does actually portend to the peak auto theory. So I, I would subscribe that 10 years from now, we will sell less cars than we do today on an absolute volume basis. But cars will continue to be a very, very important part of our life. We'll just use the cars that we sell more efficiently. And by the way, when you use a car more percent of the time, obviously the replacement rate increases. So that offsets that, that factor a little bit. So, thank you very much. So then I will move to Christian Badaji. Uh, Christian is the head of the Mobility Institute of the AECC, the, the, the Automobile Club of Catalonia. And Christian can certainly explain some of the peculiarity of the Catalan uh, customers and users of mobility. But what I would like to ask you is also, what are the measures that the, 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 the organization, the RAC, is preparing in order to face the evolution of the market for the future? Thank you, Gabriele. Thank you, Jean. I was one of the attendees of your first conference here <laughs> last year, Thank the digital you. one. The virtual conference, yeah. yes. And let me say that definitely your conferences are always interesting, but definitely in person, they are much better. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a glad to, it, I'm glad to have you here. Thank you. Let me explain that track. It's a mobility club uh, with more than 800,000 uh, members. And we provide travel assistance to, to people and, and insurance to, to vehicles. That's the, the main business. But keeping all these end users in, in, in mind, we advocate in favor of safe, sustainable, equitable, and intelligent mobility, which are more or less yeah, very uh, aligned. The, the same words that you yeah. used in your, in your final uh, slide. And, and also regarding Euram mobility, our current challenge is to identify uh, share connected and electric solutions for all these users, which are more or less the case right. <laughs> that you, you also used. In these urban solutions, of course, we, we integrate uh, bikes, scooters, uh, mobility as a service, including public transport in these MISS solutions, and of course, cars and motorbikes that will evolve in, in, this, in this sense of, of um, and connected, shared, and, and electric mobility. And, and, and if Gabriele doesn't mind, may I set a question to, to, to John? Can I Please. Come? Um, I've write it down because I want to meet the expectations. And, and it's a short reflection. It's a common statement among public administrations and, and mobility providers that their focus is to fulfill users and users' needs. Um, may this user end as a spoiled child, let's say, as he gets used to, to, to move as he wants and whenever he wants. And is it really convenient to, to make him feel the center of the universe of mobility? And <laughs> in other words, let's say more. Yeah. Uh, to what extent uh, do collective mobility needs go ahead of individual solutions or vice versa? To what extent can individual needs determine collective mobility responses? That was my question. Well, I love this question. Uh, the spoiled child who thinks that 
my mobility needs c come ahead of everyone else's. It's a very interesting conversation in mobility circles. Um, the concept of is too much mobility a bad thing, right? So I think we can all think of the business person who jets off to Cape Town for one meeting and you know jets back and that's a lot of CO2, right? The more CO2 than you and I drive in a year and say, yeah, I'm not comfortable with that. And we can think of sort of like the people making meaningless trips and so forth. I caution against that because we have to ask, you know, what are we, what's the problem we're trying to fix? The problem we're trying to fix with transportation is not transportation itself. The problem we're trying to fix are the negative externalities associated with transportation, air pollution, noise, people getting hurt, and so forth, right? So to the extent that technology can enable us to overcome some of those challenges, I think that's a very good thing. And, you know, if we could have lunch, you and I, do you like uh, Japanese food? Okay, how about you and I have lunch tomorrow in Tokyo, and we talk about this, and it will cost you five dollars, five euros to get to Tokyo. Will you do it? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Tokyo, tomorrow, okay, yes. Yeah, okay, <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a great, you know, great food. So it's, it's, the question is, for many people, they'd say, hey, if I could have lunch in Singapore or Paris or Barcelona or some cool place, and it, I could just magically get there without cost, of course I'd go there. And by the way, I might make some friends. And by the way, I might talk to some people who live in a different country. And they might ask me about the politics in my country. And I might ask them about the politics in their country. And we might come to understand each other better and actually make the world a better place. That's, all, that's a good thing, right? So it's the, it's the, the pollution and, and these things that, that we're trying to address. Now, why I love your question is because it it, it gets into some sort of philosophical concepts around mobility. Is mobility a human right? This is a question that has been debated, right? I mean, is a basic level of mobility a human right? What's the absolute lack of mobility? It's, it's incarceration. It's putting somebody in jail. That's what we do to punish people when they've done something bad. So that sort of implies that some degree of mobility is a human right. And you know, there's a, a woman in, in the United States, her name is Salita Reynolds. She's the head of transportation for the city of Los Angeles, a very thoughtful individual. And you know, she's been thinking a lot about this concept of a universal basic mobility, right? So, in the United States, and I think in other places, this concept of universal basic income. People are thinking, well, maybe we, you know, as we go through the, the fourth industrial revolution, we should just pay people a certain base rate so that they have the basics of survival. Well, maybe we should pay everybody certain basic mobility. That's something that, you know, that, that we could debate. I'm not advocating that. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's, to me, it's just very interesting to kind of think about these sets of questions. And these questions are based on values, and values are based on society, which, as we know, varies from community to country and, and around the world. So thank you very much. And uh, now I will um, move to Judith, Judith Batayer. Uh, who is the founder of Sixter and uh, is also a, a prominent mobility consultant. And so, Judith, Sixter foresees that in 10 years we will actually face the situation that also John was describing with the case. No? Mm -hmm. I mean, the electric, share connected, and autonomous, autonomous mobility. In your opinion, what, uh, how the connected uh, mobility will impact on the business operators in a city like Barcelona? Well, thank you for, uh, for raising me this question. In fact, uh, this sentence, this prediction was from the World Economic Forum. One day they say that. 
uh, they forget that maybe it could be a COVID or something like that, a virus, <laughs> and and that changed everything. So I, I, it's something that I will I will I will talk to you later. I will explain to you later. But um, uh, answering your question, the, for me, what is the the biggest uh, challenge that we have now is that uh, what it means operator first. Because now the operators, the actors that are inside of this ecosystem, this integrated ecosystem, have changed, really changed. So first we have to review this, this world. Also, if I follow a little bit uh, your speech, because it was uh, interesting the way that uh, you, you, you explain uh, how is, what is happening in this moment, you talk about immobility and all the challenges that we have. Uh, in Barcelona, Thanks also to all these uh, in Barcelona, in Catalonia, in uh, in, uh, in Europe. In fact, uh, we are uh, we are promoting a lot uh, mobility, electric mobility. But what happened because the COVID uh, in uh, Barcelona uh, it, that the e-scooter increase, motor sharing increase. So all that was a kind of personal mobility increase for the fear for one side, and also because there was a change in our city that promoted especially for the, 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 the city hall that it was what it, we call the, the tactic urbanism. That is something, some of these uh, photos that you, you, you show to us. Uh, so these scooters, this motor sharing that Casa Sea has also, and you can, uh, you can also go and, and see, uh, needs regulation, something that you also, in this fantastic speech uh, one year ago, you talk about. It's necessary that we, com we follow with regulation. So there are a lot of uh, new models, new operators that are rising. Also, if we go through integration, now in this moment, we are testing mass in Barcelona, a mass system, a, a mobility, a kind of mobility as a service system. I suppose that Cristina will explain a little bit more, maybe. Or I say that uh, till the 60th of uh, July, we, are try, we can try this new, uh, new contact leg system that uh, I hope um, uh, one day will really integrate. It will not only inform us uh, uh, Christian was explaining the integrator that we have in this moment, that, uh, that uh, they are, uh, they are uh, you, you have uh, a digital system uh, that we can um, see a choice, a choose a, a different kind of, uh, of um, op operators, uh, share or no share, also mm -hmm. public transport, but now we will, we will able to pay. F finally, we will be able to pay. And I hope that one day, a rack <laughs> is able to also, that we, we can pay through this system. So this is the kind of new models and new, new systems that uh, we are using. Also this morning, it was really interesting. I was in a journey that we, t we were talking about uh, people, uh, inclusive mobility. And this is another key issue. You say, is mobility a right? All uh, people that we were in this moment, uh, uh, in this journey and we, in this debate, we are sure that mobility is a right and it must be a right for everybody. So this moment, there are a lot of uh, new business, new, uh, new uh, applications, new integrator integrations, new digital systems that are raising to, to help any kind of people, whatever it was that, uh, your capabilities, to use uh, the transport system. So this is also a new business. And also, and uh, I will finish with uh, something that you talk about Ferrovial. Ferrovial is here also, and I know perfectly that you are in touch uh, with them, collaborating in different things. But I would like that you have a look to say it too. Because this is, uh, for me, is one of the, uh, you, you explain to us, uh, or you talk about Daimler or Ford, but have a look to this uh, company that, he, that you are in Barcelona. And I believe that uh, you will be surprised for how they, cho they choose change from a car constructor to a mobility 
uh, offering yeah. a mobility service company and uh, how they split all the kind of services and how they are doing something really interesting in this moment and here in Casa Seat that you can try all this shared mobility that you were talking about. So this is another example of how we can move, operators can move. And I will let uh, uh, Christina talk about public transport because it's, uh, it's her topic. Thank you very much. So going, going to that, let me, let me ask you something. That is, uh, everything is about digital in this moment. We are putting in place a lot of um, uh, electric mobility systems, but we have already another technology that is the autonomous one and that needs a lot of electric connected, um, shared also. The mobility is here. The evolution of the car constructor, constructors, uh, finally it will be uh, integrators. The technology is here and we need regulation. We need what to put this kind of a technology also in the streets? Talking about the autonomous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd love to talk about autonomous. First, let me just say to your point about SEAT, absolutely, uh, you know, from my observation, very innovative. I think the proof is upstairs in the lobby where, you know, as I mentioned, you see vehicles that look very different from what, you know, perhaps the founder of SEAT would have considered as the traditional product uh, 70 years ago. Um, and so, and, you know, Lucas, what you and your team are doing, lots of fantastic innovation coming out of this company. So uh, my compliments to, to my host. Um, on autonomous, uh, so who in this room was more than 20 years old in 1999? Who was more than 20 years old in 1999? Uh, okay, all right, well, quite a few hands, good. Okay, so some. we remember, we remember e-commerce. Think about e-commerce in 1999, right? It was going to change the world. There was dot-com this, dot-com that, there was massive enthusiasm. The NASDAQ, the various tech markets were going out the ceiling. And then what happened? It all just crashed, right? And we had this long sort of lag. But through that long lag, you know, companies like Amazon kept moving forward, kept advancing, kept building supply chains, kept coming up with innovations in robotics, kept increasing scale. And here we are 20 years later in this massive pandemic and everything gets delivered to our house in many cases. I mean, it, across the world, e-commerce has now had 20 years later that transformational effect that we thought would happen 20 years ago. We just thought it would happen much faster. That's autonomous vehicles. That's where we are. You know, we had that moment of hype. Now we're living a little bit in the aftermath of the hangover. <clears throat> but, I mean, absolutely amazing companies, very amazing people are working every single day on moving these systems forward. Um, you know, some of them at your company, all around the world. So this innovation will happen and it will transform. You know, in my view, it will have a transformative effect, but we'll probably feel that in 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And then we'll remember back in 2017, when we all thought that autonomous vehicles would change the world by 2020, and that didn't happen. So that's kind of my, my view on the, on the technology. I know, you know we're in Barcelona, we have to give um, uh, credence to the, to the, you know, in many ways being in one of the most innovative cities around mobile technology and 5G and all of that. And, you know, maybe some people are saying, oh, I keep talking about 5G, you know, but when is it actually gonna do something? I do believe 5G will have a, a significant impact on automotive connectivity and uh, on autonomous systems. You know, it's just, it's going to take some, some time 
uh, to, to, to get there. Um, so I don't know if I answer your question, but long term, I'm very optimistic about the positive impact that can come from autonomous systems. Um, I can also, you know, there's also an autonomous heaven and an autonomous hell. And we definitely want to avoid the autonomous hell, uh, which is sending your autonomous vehicle to go and pick up your dry cleaning at the store down the street and taking up city space um, and using energy to do that. So that follows from sort of the, the type of, um, you know, re uh, regulatory system that we implement so that cities and countries can sort of provide the right framework for t autonomous vehicles to, to really deliver value. Good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Judith and John. Maybe just a quick comment. Um, you know, in some ways, you're the most important person in this room because the public transportation system for any city is absolutely essential. And, you know, in that autonomous vehicle hype that I just alluded to four years ago, uh, there were a number of folks who were saying, you know, we don't need, we don't even need the sub, we don't need buses, we don't need the subway anymore because we're all going to be in our shared autonomous pods moving around the city. Um, and, you know, I've often said that anyone who thinks you can take the entire population of the London tube and bring them up to the surface and put them in autonomous pods and have a better mobility solution for London, uh, you know, needs to get their head examined. Um, it, it's a it really important component of the urban uh, mobility system, and absolutely, it's the greatest opportunity for integration. And I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's messy. It's, you know, confusing. You have an obligation to serve, uh, you know, a public stakeholder, uh, you, you know, the, the people of the city, and private operators have a motivation to make money, right? So it, it's a messy system, uh, but trying to work through that system is nonetheless hugely important. And you also alluded to mobility as a service, which is in many ways what I was talking about with integration. It's like, can't we just get there where, you know, our it's all through our phone and it's so much easier to move from the Seat scooter to the metro up to Plaza Catalunya and then to transfer you know, with a Cabify and then to get to where you parked your personal use Seat and go to where you're going. That is the dream. Right, that, and, and to have sort of a seamless uh, payment system. That, that is absolutely the dream. You know, the question is, who owns this? Who owns this? Because whoever owns this owns you. And so, you know, this thing, and then you had a bunch of private players who wanted to own this, and they wanted to own you. And, you know, I hope there's nobody from Uber here, but in a way, that was Uber's strategy, to say, we are going to own the customer. We are going to be the Amazon of transportation. And you, the Barcelona Metro, are going to subscribe onto our platform under our terms. Uh, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. That's very interesting, really. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christina. So, uh, I will, uh, as you can imagine, uh, also in, in SEAT we have some experts of mobility. So I, I, I asked to, to a couple of my colleagues to, to join the conversation today. And one of them is actually uh, Lucas Casasnovas. Lucas is the managing director of SEAT MO, uh, which is the organization who is uh, creating actually a new line of products and services, uh, particularly innovative from our standpoint, which are based on the, on, the, on the forecast of the new uh, technology and the new behavior of the customers. And uh, Lucas is actually, uh, with, with Selmo, we are exploring uh, new business models. Among them, we are launching, we, la we launched the, the motor sharing in Barcelona, uh, based also on a digital platform, coming to your point, 
uh, able to localize the vehicle, detect the level of battery, allow users uh, to drive it, but most of all, owning the data of the, of the people. So what are the learnings that this digital customer journey is leading to our organization as SEAT? Leading to our organization. What learnings do we, uh, are we collecting as organization after the launch of the digital platform and uh, the mobility uh, service with SEATMO? So the, the learnings from us are, are uh, clear. So we are much closer to the customers. So selling cars, you are with the importer, then you are with the dealer. You have so many layers until you get to the final customer. With the sharing and through the platform, we are in direct contact with the uh, customers, with the final customers. So we know which are their needs, and uh, we are much faster to meet these needs of the customer. This is point number one. Point number two, what we see is that we can advance uh, the trends as well. So uh, now we see that people, customers at the end, they want to the things much faster. You know? We see this also with e-commerce that you were mentioning as well. So now we see that uh, customers want to have individual mobility, but then very fast. With the platform, they, where do I have the scooter? I reserve it now, I take it now. And very important, and I see this in comparison to public transport, from door to door. So individual, so yeah. I, I do not have to interact with others. Very important during the COVID uh, yeah. months. And then door to door, so I can save also a lot of time going to where I want to go. So, and uh, with this, we think it's a very, this is also a, a learning, very efficient. You were saying that the cars, uh, so are the, the use rate is maximum 5%. With the scooters that we have in the, in the city, the asset is much more optimized, let's yeah. say this. And doing so, then we can decrease prices, so we make mobility more, at least from our point of view, this is also one learning, uh, more affordable and more accessible to the people. So we are, it's good for them, and at the end, of course, we're here to make business good for us as well. So these are the key learnings that we got from the sharing business now. And of course, if uh, we uh, are able to scale this up, we will bring these benefits to yeah. other customers, other cities, other countries as well, uh, not only in Barcelona. Cool. Yeah, and congratulations. Um, you know, it's it, it's I've seen the the scooters. Uh, you know, Seat and others. So many moving around the city, uh, just in the short time that I've been here, and uh, you know, it's it's impressive. You know, to to see that uh, development. And um, you're absolutely right. The utilization is much greater, right? So you're really, you know, building these. It, 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 one little quick comment, right? So I think in some ways, micromobility and scooters more specifically got a bit of a bad reputation during what was called the scooter bombing days when, you know, these companies like Bird would just show up and dump thousands of scooters on the streets of any city. And then, of course, city officials would be like, what just happened? <laughs> and how do we deal with this? Um, and yeah, so that's one element that may not have been the best uh, long-term business strategy. Uh, but another is the fact, I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but there is real technology that goes into these vehicles. And I don't think we should underestimate that. So, uh, you know, I would want a company like Seat, you know, with the technological resources of really the entire Volkswagen group behind it, uh, involved with the design of that battery, involved with the, the mechanic, there's sensors that can be put on scooters that can detect if somebody has, if somebody's hurt, if somebody's been in an accident, there are design parameters that can really make these vehicles just much safer. And that first generation of scooters that was dumped on the streets of the world was basura. I don't know, is that the word? <laughs> so, yeah, let's, it's, it's good that, that you're making this uh, investment. Thank you very much. Um, now we come back to, to, to a little bit to, to the industry, to the, 
to the industrial uh, point of view with uh, Lourdes de la Sota. Uh, Lourdes is, has been recently appointed as a, she, she is a long time with uh, the Volkswagen organization and SEAT particularly, but she is fresh in the new role of director of corporate strategy and institutional relation of SEAT Cupra and more things. But uh, I, will, uh, I will just ask to Lourdes, taking in consideration that the government just announced it, uh, the approval of the PERT, which is a plan in order, a public plan, in order to support the electrification of the automotive industry. So Lourdes, in your opinion, is this plan enough in order to keep the Spanish uh, competitivity and what challenges or opportunities we might face as an organization? Okay, thank you, thank you Gabriele, and thank you very much, Jan. Um, so, I think that the announcements of the PERTE for us, for the whole industry in Spain, for the automotive industry, was really a very good notice, as you can imagine. I mean, for SEAT and the, for the whole Volkswagen Group, uh, we, we, we really appreciate and, and we are really, I mean, it was a great news. It was really great news for us because with the acceleration in the transformation of, mobi of the whole mobility value chain, towards electrification, I mean, as you already said, John, we are facing a big, big challenge. A big, big challenge and a lot of efforts that we should combine all the efforts together, the public, the administration, the, the private industry, and also with the support of the European economy. I think that with the opportunity of the PERTE and with the opportunity of the next generation EU funds, this is the, really the opportunity we have mm -hmm. to, I would say, reinforce the Spanish industry and really to, to maintain our leadership position in, the, in, in Europe, because as you know, we are the second manufacturer in, in Europe. And with this big impulse of, of the government, I think that, I mean, in the future, I mean, with these big investments, we are really going to be able to challenge the, the Green Deal and the whole digital transformation in automotive. Here we are talking, I mean, the, the announcement of the government was of an investment, a public investment of around more than 4 billion euros. And if you take into account that these public investments of 4.3 million euros, uh, billion euros are complementary to the 20 billion euros that we have to invest in the economy in the next years in Spain in order really to, 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 to face this future and, and, and this new industrial challenge. No? I mean, you have been talking about the new business models and I totally agree with you that at the end we are facing I mean, the, the new business models, and this is what we are doing at SEAT, né, to um, amplify our business models, because at the end, I mean, uh, this is mainly due to the, to the, to the new uh, needs or, or behaviors of our customers. But in addition, we don't have to, to, to forget about the new regulations. And at the end, it's a combination of both. I mean, the, the, the big challenge that we have in the automotive industry is not only to understand that we have to sell the cars in a different way, we have to go to usage in, instead of ownership, but in addition, we have to achieve the regulations. And the regulations, as you already mentioned before, are uh, getting more and more uh, unflexible and, and ambitious. So we are yeah. facing an enormous challenge in the whole industry. And this is the reason why I think that we have really to merge all our strengths together, together with the administration, together, because at the end we are talking here about a big wave in the GDP in Spain. We are in the, the automotive industry, is a, 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 has a, around 12% of the GDP in Spain, and we have really to, to, to all together to merge our efforts in order to, to really to invest in the future of the mobility in Spain and also in innovation because at the end, I mean, if you don't invest, if you don't uh, uh, develop and if you don't evolve, yeah. at the end we are not profitable and we are not going to be able to be competitive in the automotive and also in innovation. No, So I yeah. think that we, we should not forget the importance of the automotive industry 
and of course, at the end, really to, to, to adapt and to, together with the new mobility services and with all the, but at the end, I think that, that um, for, for us, it's very, very important to, to highlight the importance of the, of the industry. At the end, with the PERTE, we have the framework really to mobilize a, a lot of a, a private and public resources to maintain, as I said before, the Spanish competitiveness in the automotive no? by transforming the whole value chain. The big advantage of this PERTE is that we are not only supporting or the government and, and the European Commission is not only supporting the, the, the development of cars and, and, and also the production, it's supporting the whole value chain. This means that we are tracking a lot of suppliers and, and we are ge really generating a lot of additional business by, by localizing the whole value chain in, Sp in Spain. No? As you already mentioned before, the, the cell factory and, and the, the lithium extraction, and I mean, this is, uh, the support is, is covering the, the whole value chain. And, and I think that this is the way how we will have the opportunity to, as I said before, to reinforce the Spanish industry and also to create more resilient economies. The first challenge we have is really to impulse and to accelerate the EV sales in Spain. In mm. Spain now, we are in, uh, if, if we compare it to the rest of the European countries, I think the second worst country all over Europe. What, what was the percent of EV sales last year in Spain? Uh, uh, 4%. 4%. percent. Now yeah. we are cumulated in, in, in a June, we are around 7%. Yeah. With a with six percent, sorry, with a slight increase in the last months, uh, but at the end, I I always say it, it's like a little bit of vicious circle. At the end, as you know, there were a lot of obstacles you know, at, at at the beginning regarding electro 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 mobility, but now with the new technologies that we are launching, where a car has more than 500 uh, kilometers autonomy, yeah. and also. Uh, you know that the whole uh, uh, high-speed uh, uh, charging is you can really charge your car in 15 right. minutes. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's really evolving. In, but in the other European countries, I mean, in Europe, we have around 15% of electric vehicles. And in the case of Germany, that are really pushing a lot the, the electrification, they are uh, above 20%. Yeah. So we are really really in a very low position and at, at the right. end for us it's really important uh, that we really manage to to get additional support on the sales of electric vehicles to have additional uh, benefits uh, regarding the the, the purchase uh, sorry the purchase the purchase yes yeah. and and also uh, from the fiscal and 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 so we are fighting now not only for getting really the, the I would, we are trying really in order to, to apply to the PERTE, because as you know, now we are open to apply since until October this year. Yeah. And now we are really uh, trying to merge all the energies together with suppliers and really in order to cover the whole value chain. It's a challenge and a really beautiful yeah. project, I can tell you, uh, but with a lot of effort. But I'm sure that with the support also of, of, of the administration and, and, and getting all together, I think that we have a big a project uh, um, for Spain. And, and the only message is really that we have to fight together right. for it. And, and I would suggest three lines of argument for that fight. The first, you mentioned that the automotive industry is 12% of Spain's GDP, which is astonishing. The second you also mentioned, which is we're at 4% EV sales versus 75% for Norway. Of course, Norway is a little bit crazy, but that's now, yeah. now pushing 80. But the third, in the argument I would push is to say, look, just have a look at China, right? Because China was and is the most important country in the world when it comes to the transformation of the electrification of mobility. And, you know, the former minister of science and technology, a guy by the name of Wang Gang, 
Um, he was a, a engineer at Audi. He spoke fluent German. You know, he would, had sort of moved around in the international, sort of international automotive circuit. He's the one who pushed the Chinese government to make a massive investment in sort of, if you build it, they will come. And against a lot of opposition internally, and they built this charging infrastructure, and they built this battery capability in this industry, and they provided generous incentives to consumers to go out and buy those electric vehicles. And it took time, but it worked. And, you know, sometimes that is the role of government to sort of help us move. The, you know, the transformation does require, among many, many things, it does require real money. <laughs> and, you know, I think you have a compelling argument to make with the Spanish government to say, why is this a wise investment for the people of Spain? Pardon. And another thing I would like to add is that we have been talking with when you were saying that um, at the end the mobility is really a human right, you know, and and after the COVID we we already see the tendency that the people also want really private mobility, and and for me very very important to point out is really that we have to make the private sustainable mobility and that we have really to beg for it. Eh? And I mean, I'm not saying that public transportation is not important. Sure, it's complementary, but at the end, I mean, I think that at the end, the mobility, as you already said, is, I mean, a diverse portfolio of different services and, yeah. and ways of, of using it. And, and regarding on this, I would like to make you a question, very interesting, sure. because this is something that we are discussing internally at SEA. No, you know that it's like, we are really reconverting or transforming our whole business model, as you can imagine, eh? from the industrial point of view, from the services. We are trying to move SEAT from a product a factory to a service delivery, but anyhow, insisting really to, 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 to develop and, and, and produce also the cars that, that we want to offer for our mobility services. Mm -hmm. How and, and we have been discussing internally about the importance of the brands, you know. Mm. How do you see the importance of the development regarding the importance of the brand? Do you think that the people really in, in the future will still keep really the, or that the brands could still, due to technology, due to different types of, of services, or that we need really to, to be to still maintain the differentiation between the brands, that the, the customer really sees an importance in the differentiation of the brands, or do you see much more really only the tendency of democratizing the mobility? Well, it, it's, an, it's an excellent question, and one that the top business schools in the world could, could ponder, I think, and, and have a very rigorous debate around that question. Uh, you know, as, as you well know, traditionally, brand has ruled this industry, and there's an obsession almost with the feeling of a brand, the emotions that come with an association with an automobile brand. Um, I don't think that all of that goes away as we shift from a product to a service universe, uh, and I do think that there are opportunities, particularly you know, if there's some sort of, you know, locally felt presence of that brand to somehow people will have a greater allegiance. So, for example, in the city of Barcelona, if there were um, a um, name your mobility service operated by Seat versus another mobility service operated by um, some company out of Germany or the, or the U.S., um, yeah, yeah, I could imagine a greater sort of affinity to the, you know, to the local presence, to the local brand. Um, now, having said that, so yes, it's important, but we, I think we also have to acknowledge that brand is less important now than it was in the product days. And that now it's more about 
the ability to actually deliver you know, that, that service, uh, which is important. And this is where we get back to the question of the business models and how do we negotiate it? Because look, everybody wants to deliver value, but at the same time, you're a private company and you need to make money. You have, you have shareholders that you're accountable to. And so is there a way that we can carve up this pie so that everybody wins? So that the Barcelona Metro wins, Sayot wins, uh, this myriad of tech providers rushing into the space, they win. I think yes, the answer is yes. And I think that that question, that's the one to focus on, how to do that, rather than the brand question. But if for example, I mean, I, I, I didn't want to, to, to un I, or I don't understand that, uh, the, the brand as a technology brand at the end, it's like Tesla. I mean, Tesla, if you talk to Tesla uh, customers, most of the Tesla customers didn't uh, do not religious. speak around, yes, yes. Uh, uh, about the, the house car of and Elon. the technology of the car and the performance of the car. They are, they are really yeah. talking about the experience with the brand and Tesla yes. is a great brand. So at the end, it's like we said before, I mean, it's a change in the business model and a totally different way how to understand what is behind the car brand. But, but the Tesla brand was built off, of, ironically, of the traditional model of the automobile as you know, something that you, that you purchase and you own. Yeah. And you know, they, 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 in the United States, uh, you know, Tesla is the only automobile manufacturer that has figured out how they, can, they don't have to go through a dealer to sell their product, which has been challenged in courts across the country. But already right there, they, you know, they almost uh, started with a kind of you know, disadvantage to directly connect uh, with their customer. Because as you pointed out, for car companies, they have to go through these distribution networks and their dealers. And it's very difficult to actually you know, connect directly with the, yeah. with the customer. Um, so I think that that contributes to that importance of the, the Tesla brand, you know, being a leader, this sort of bizarre, um, larger than life personality of the CEO of the company and yeah. all of those factors contribute. Yeah. So is it the rule or is it the exception? Please have a look to something else that they did better than anybody else. That it was look at all the customer experience. They look at all the customer journey of this uh, of the day customers, yeah. and they solve every point. Yeah. And this is something that is also interesting to to look at. So yeah. you can you can charge your battery at home. You can charge your battery at at work. You can charge the battery whatever you want because you will have uh, they they are sure. Yeah, you're uh, uh, Judith, you're absolutely right. And not only that, but they made a massive investment to build the supercharger network. Exactly. That you, was pretty uh, audacious, right? The pretty integration, bold the for app, a car the to, app to is bringing you to everywhere. So it's everything that yeah. uh, that um, it's it's whole the whole customer journey, yeah. the whole customer experience. It's an integration yeah. concept, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So th th thank you very much. I think uh, we are a little bit uh, out of time, but I will also give the opportunity to the public to raise one or two questions before we close the the, yeah. the night, the, the events, and I see some. Some Hi, I'd like to thank Casa Siet and John for uh, coming to see, uh, inviting us this evening. Yeah, uh, I'm also John, um, and I'm through mechanical engineering and a second degree in sociology and communications, and then a master's in uh, from the MIT in innovation and design. Awesome. Um, wow. I have over the last year been working on an idea um, that fits in with everything that was being talked about, and it's about uh, providing. Uh, transport as a natural resource or as a resource for people. So I've designed optimal global transportation. That's, uh, well, uh, let me read a question because I know I'm getting a little bit nervous. I'm not used to talking to a lot of people. So, uh, <clears throat> so in the last year, I've created an optimal global mobility solution, a format to save lives and to help save our planet and to democratize mobility for global empowerment. 
Post-Lobed mobility will change little and slowly if you are coerced and manipulated by the industrial military complex and the American ideal that humanity must utilize automobiles, autonomy and EV. As a policymaker and consultant, which I believe you are, John, yes, in many yeah. ways? Yes. Um, I'm not Why, a policy maker. Oh, sorry. Well, I contributor, a, cons a consultant. But I am a consultant. Yeah, so sorry. Half yes, half no. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, do, why do you think major tech companies have failed to develop competent solutions and continually revert to the adaptation of century old modes? Uh, for reference, I'd just like to bring up the electric scooter now ubiquitous on our streets. Wasn't a Google or an Apple creation and the Policymakers, legislators, and governments were perplexed on many levels, highlighting the incompetency of current structures and processes to deal with change. So the question being, the question being, like, what can what can be done about that? Why why are these tech companies not the ones pushing to get things done? The ones with the biggest budgets, the falling back on old old ideas that are century old, like the electric car, like buses, etc. Well, this is a long question. I'll try to give a short answer to a, long, a big idea. Um, I think that tech companies, a la Apple, Uber, you know, Amazon, you name it, um, it in, in many ways, they also went through a learning experience where you had tech companies trying to become car companies because, you know, oh, those guys in Detroit and Stuttgart, they're so dumb, they don't know what they're doing, we can do it much better. And then you had car companies trying to become software companies, <laughs> moving from the other side, and uh, it didn't, it, it hasn't worked out perfectly for either of them, right? I mean, there have been challenges on both sides, um, you know, Tesla is really, really, truly an exceptional company. Um, the, the history of the electric vehicle is littered with failed electric vehicle companies coming from very innovative parts of the world. And so there's, there's something to be learned from, I think, from, from those, those, uh, those, those failures. Yeah. Thank you very much. Another question? I see. Uh, an end uh, raised. Um, I'm not sure what it was. But microphone's there, so let's uh, yeah. go there and then, yeah. then so we'll come back. The, mm, my first question, oh, can I have two short questions? The first one is, the, the, the problem of mi mobility in the cities is kind of solved because like the means of transport are kind of covered like among the distances that people travel and, uh, and the, the, the why they travel, right? And but uh, the far the, the further you get from the city, the I, the more complicated it gets, and it's called a kind of like a last mile problem. Yes, the IMB or TMB probably knows this. That the further you get from the city center, the bus services yeah. are worse. And as density de exactly declines. as the density of population yeah. decreases, and that's why, for example, flying from Berlin to Barcelona, you fly in two hours, but then it takes you two hours to go from Barcelona to Sabadell or to Terrassa, right? Yep. And this is, this is the problem. And I wanted to ask if you have any kind of idea or solution uh -huh. to this kind of problem to the areas that are not so densely populated as the cities where you can use a scooter, you can, what, is this uh, maybe the car sharing doesn't will, will not work in this kind of situation? So, are, but for sure there is something needed for for this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's some unique opportunities in uh, what you could call high density paths through low density areas. So, what I mean by that is, you know, anyone who's come to visit the wonderful city of New York in my country. Uh, it's quite a different experience when you land at Kennedy Airport. Um, first of all, it can be painful just getting through our immigration people, but let's say you get through that hurdle. You know, it's, it's a little bit the public transportation system to get from the Kennedy Airport to downtown Manhattan is, is lacking, to say the least. Um, much better here in Barcelona. It's very obvious where you need to go. So there is an opportunity there for you know, an urban aerial mobility corridor 
to take high, you know, large volumes of passengers from the airport down into, into Manhattan. And I can imagine some other opportunities there. We didn't talk about urban aerial mobility tonight. Um, it's, it's also up there in many ways on that hype curve that we talked about. Uh, but having said that, th you know, it, there's a revolution happening in the skies right now with the, the EV tall technology. And I do think that these vehicles will find niches in the market that are very compelling and financially viable. And I think some of those sort of, you know, again, high density paths through low density areas, um, you know, may, may, there may be opportunities uh, there. I'll just, I'll just but yeah. to Super your bigger question mm -hmm. about, about the, about, Solution, you know, how do you solve low density? I understand. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really, really of course. tough challenge, right? There's no good answer to that that, I, that I'm aware of. The, the, the other question is a little bit critical because I've heard this, uh, these um, uh, Seattle representatives talking about the, the uh, phenomenon of, of, of Tesla, for example. I'm not a kind of a, a fan of, like in a way, the, the crazy fan of, of this company. But um, if you look at the, at, uh, at the process that the client has to go through at the web page of Tesla and any other com car company, it's, it's ridiculous. It takes three minutes to buy Tesla, and it takes uh, an hour to, to choose from millions of options of Audi or yeah, BMW yeah, and things yeah. like this. You, you just lost there yeah. choosing the materials, the finishing, and everything. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm asking because th th these co car companies, like German car companies, always build their kind of supremacy based on their technology kind of um, potential. But now, like with the Tesla, this, all this know-how just dis disappeared and somehow like it, it leveled up. And uh, the question is whether these companies, these traditional in a way companies like, like BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen, can follow up Tesla that is providing the service that they don't have a huge car services in a city center. They deliver cars with a, on the lorries. It's, it's, it's way faster and way more efficient. Yeah. They have five colors, two uh, forms of wheels, and uh, two colors of the interior, and that's it. That's yeah. the car. You yeah. have it here. And Audi has to, you were talking yeah. about that you have it's to. It's overwhelming, it, yeah. the choice. The people from chat were talking that how difficult it is to transform the whole delivery system. Well, if you maybe didn't complicate your delivery system so much, you wouldn't have to simplify it right now. I yeah. think I don't think Tesla has these problems. Well, I, I agree with you. There is a little bit of self-imposed pain among the traditional vehicle manufacturers. Uh, maybe it stems from overly zealous marketing departments. I don't know. But it reminds me of a social psychology experiment conducted many years ago where the researcher went to a supermarket and offered consumers five different types of jam. You know, jam, the thing you spread on your toast. You can have strawberry, you can have blueberry, you can have peach, right? you know, five. And they measured the consumer's reaction to this and, you know, how they made the decision, how happy they were with the decision that they made, et cetera. Then they went in and they offered 25 different types of jam. Now you can have boysenberry and blackberry and this and that and fig and you name it. And people were overwhelmed. And they weren't happy. They, in fact, it, many of them had this sort of fear that I made the wrong choice. Oh, what if I had liked fig better than boysenberry? So there is, I think, some truth to you know, that, that argument that there's been an over complexity in, in many sort of automotive offerings. That flows down into the production chain as well. You know, anyone who's spent time in an assembly plant and talked to the people working there and, you know, how much complexity, how much variation do you have to deal with in that production process? Really big question. And then finally, as you pointed out in the, the actual distribution mechanism, um, you know, that's a place where I think Tesla has a real big advantage. So good points, but I think many of the tr car companies are, are learning. Oh, we have a rebuttal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is part of the transformation that we need to do. And anyhow, um, with the with electrification, with electric cars, we are really reducing 
the yeah, complexity. The complexity. Out complexity. But this is yeah. one of the biggest issues that you know. This is that are the fights of the of the engineers against the <laughs> production. Yeah with sales and marketing and so, and this is one of the biggest things that, I mean, in our case, that we are changing our, our distribution model with Cupra, you know, that we are changing into a agency model with Cupra, now with the launch of Born, the new car, the new electric car, so we are going to, to, to have the ownership of, of, the, of, the, of the stock, so it, yeah. Pues with Cupra, we are really trying to really to, to pilot with a new brand, you know, these new ways of doing and distribution system, digitalization and everything. And this is how we are learning. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much, Lourdes. I think we had one question from this side, another one from that side, and then I will possibly close the session if you don't mind. Please. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I actually used to live in Boston until eight years ago. Oh, fantastic. And uh, I came back to Barcelona, to my city, and, yeah. uh, and I don't have a car. So, okay. Uh, what, um, I work in the electronic industry. Actually, I work for uh, the media division of Arrow Electronics, which you probably know. Um, and we cover mostly the telecom industry. And recently, I was in the Mobile World Congress here in Barcelona a couple of weeks ago. There was a small edition of the, of the show, but anyway, it was very, very interesting. And one of the things that they are talking right now is because of the, the way that operators, let's say cellular carriers, you know, are changing. And because they used to have a very vertical business model, basically, they, they, they were you know, putting together the network with the network uh, manufacturers and just selling voice and data and things like that to customers. But right now the network has changed. 5G is offers some very, very new possibilities. And the thing is that what is happening is that the operators do not know how to sell that. So they have to collaborate with other companies because other companies are actually selling their products to their customers without them. What I'm trying to say here is that big auto manufacturers that have been around for a long time, they have a very, very traditional business model. And this is changing very, very fast because elect electrification, because of the way that digitalization of the industry, all these kind of things. But what is happening with, you know, communicating with customers and especially through the sales channels? Because it, what is happening here and the, the figures that uh, they have been given here, about 4% of electric vehicles sold in Spain, is actually happening as well because dealers don't want to sell those cars. And, and there needs to be, and this is something that is going on on the telecom industry, it needs to be a re-education yeah. both on the company, yeah. on the salespeople, and also on the distribution system. And at the same time, they have to collaborate horizontally with other companies in the ecosystem, especially when we're talking about the, the hyperscales. Everything is going digital. Everything is going to the cloud. Everything is going to be kind of, you know, flexible in a way, both on supply chain, manufacturing, recycling. One of the things that you mentioned is batteries. Batteries need to have a second life. And it's not just we're going to take out, you know, the components, but a battery that was not good anymore for a car can be storage for, uh, for, for example, renewables, which is the biggest problem we have today about producing electricity. So this circular economy concept as well has to come to the industry. But anyway, maybe these are two or different things. Just one quick question for you. How much does it cost to park in Boston today? Too much. It, I mean, it's remarkable. You can park easily for, and my friends from Europe are astonished when yeah. they come to visit me. You can easily pay $30 to park for 45 minutes in downtown Boston. That's what I want in Barcelona. 
<laughs> I see your point. Yeah, that might be a bit extreme, but yes. Okay, that's too much. Yes. But anyway, that's that's too much. But anyway, I think uh, I think curbside parking is about ten dollars an hour or something like that. Yeah, you know, curbside okay. is much much less expensive, but it's very difficult to find. Well, so you have to be in your hunting yeah. mentality to actually score a curbside parking spot during daylight hours yeah. in the city of Boston. I think he was two euros an hour, so it's, you know, still yeah. very cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. But very, thank it's you also very much limited. For it's also, you know, usually just one hour max or maybe two hours max. Yeah. So thank you so much. And then we move to the last question. Hey, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. So, um, <laughs> I'll come to you right after, and we'll finish it off. Thank you very much. I, I very much enjoyed that, John. My name is Gareth McNaughton. I'm the director for um, the European Institute of Innovation Technology, Urban Mobility. We are very lucky to call Barcelona our home. Yes. Our headquarters. EIT. Yes, and we work with our friends in SEAT. It's lovely to be in your building again. Um, I was very interested in the holistic approach, if you're talking about sharing. Yeah. And we're very aware, humans, we don't share well. You know, we, we, do not, we like our toys. We, you know? Yeah, we do yeah. not share well. And we're seeing some of the innovation not necessarily coming from the bigger car companies. You know, we, we have met some very crazy, wacky people. And when they were given 60,000 euro, not 20 billion, they changed the Hague. They went to a street and they said, if you will come together as families, we will give you some cars. We will give you a few bikes, a few scooters, something for a cargo, and you promise to give up your car. And they had to collect enough people. And if you do that, the city will give you back the parking spaces. And they got six green spaces in a country that's densely populated where no one has gardens. That man, for 60,000 euro, did change the face of the Netherlands right now. And now he's got his own company. And the number of car companies lining up chasing framework contracts to be the provider because people behaved better. I know that David two doors down <laughs> is using that car in two hours after I got home. And the communication between the neighbors improved. People walked more. Yeah. And that was a holistic approach to how to address mobility. Now what we're seeing is masses of money being flung again without looking at how people behave. Yeah. And this is a serious concern. What's happening in the US, I know that there's a lot of big tech investment and they're looking at you know, the electrification of the roads and all these. What's happened with how people behave in the US? Well, I'm, I heard, I'm so delighted to get this question because I, I really believe that behave, the intersection of behavioralism and mobility is a, you know a very very important research area going forward, um, you know. So, I'm a fellow at MIT. I'm actually going to be taking on a, a bigger role there, um, and I personally have been very inspired by the faculty uh, director of the program, a uh, fellow by the name of Jinwa Zhao. And so he's a professor of urban planning. And his whole focus has been on that intersection of mobility and behavioralism and getting to that question of what causes people to change their behavior. I think you've provided a very interesting example, you know, where, you know, the failure of sharing uh, vehicles is, you know, you just pick up a car and somebody was smoking cigarettes or eating donuts or it's dirty or it smells bad and you don't want that. And it, that to have it, it with the car is exclusively shared among a sub community of individuals who can hold each other accountable. That's the behavioral dynamic that you've built into that system. I think it's a very compelling e e example. Um, and I think we'll see much, much more going forward about this uh, research into behavioralism. What I can share with you, and I'm happy to sh pass these studies on to you. At MIT, uh, we, we did a, a study on what we call car pride, which is to look at what are the real motivational factors where people derive a sense of identity and pride from being a vehicle owner, sh owner and that very much ties to the question of brand. And we looked across country, you know, maybe 
40 countries across the world. I'm sure Spain is in that data set. And it is really quite interesting, the findings, that almost consistently, the more developed countries have less car pride than the rapidly developing and emerging economies. And that, that's a very important uh, study, I think, for vehicle manufacturers to take a close look at. The n ironically, the notable exception in this was the United States, which has an unusually high level of car pride, uh, you know, relative to where, as you know, as being a wealthy uh, country. Um, but you know, Germany, for example, surprisingly, you know, I, the 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 research showed not not nearly as much as I would have expected. So anyway, that's an example of looking at sort of like how people's attitudes, what they feel about the whole process of owning a vehicle, how that has an influence on their behaviors. Because clearly, a, car, a high car pride country is going to be inherently less successful with any sort of sharing business model than a low car, kide, low car pride country. Cool. So thank you very much. We have another question. I think, Sorry. I think uh, it's very late. So maybe if it's very short. Can we have the last question here? I will be quick. Um, thank you for this interesting speech. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, out of this, uh, I extract lots of concepts. But one of them is that electrification is clearly the future. And it's really exciting. But um, there's an uncertain feature for, for us car enthusiasts who love uh, the feel of a stick shift and who love the sound of a, of, of a car, I would like to know what would you say to us uh, in terms of the f relating to the future, to, uh, to us being able to, to drive these cars? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, you know, I guess the way I view it is, there, first of all, there's still very much room for the, tr the traditional business model of a car, personally owned, and even the traditional powertrain of a car, you know, petrol driven, in uh, suburban and rural settings. You know, it's, it, the, the, the issue it comes into play when you enter, you know, densely populated areas. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's a little bit kind of like the horse, right? I mean, we used to use horses to get around and then this thing called the car came along and we stopped using horses. Did horses go away? No, because some people still love horses and they like to use the horses, but they need a lot of space and a lot of hay to feed the horse and to take care of them. Maybe you're a horse owner, you know, that you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have your uh, fleet of wonderful, beautiful uh, Italian and you know, German and you name it, um, uh, you know, wonderfully mechanically engineered vehicles that you really enjoy driving in the countryside, and that's okay. That's okay. You know, as long as, you know, it's not, uh, you know, contributing to sort of the, the crisis situation that we have in, 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 in many cities. I guess that's the way I view it. So, thank you so much. I think it was by far the longest conversation we had in this room. I think it was very much interesting, John. We, I think we took a lot of profit from your presence. It was yeah. really a pleasure. And thank you for your patience. I see that some of the auditorium is still here. So it means it was <laughs> really, really interesting. So thank you so much. Have a nice night. And I hope you to see you soon in Casa Seat. Thank you, Gabriel. <laughs>